it's much better in here than it is trying to do it next right. to the still. Right. Yeah. When they're filling tanks. Yeah. Hey everyone, it's time for our second giveaway for people that have supported us through the month of June through Patreon. The winners this month are going to be receiving gifts that we got from our guest today, Josh Hollifield of Barton1792. First is a Rewit candle. It's an upcycled 1792 bottle that is now repurposed to a candle. So our first winner is going to be receiving that. A second winner is going to be receiving a poster that we got, which is a history of the Kentucky distilleries dating all the way back until 1817. Really cool stuff. The video with the random drawing was posted to Facebook and YouTube this week, so make sure you go follow us on Twitter and Facebook to see those videos. The winners for June are Andy Lancaster and Quinn English. Thank you to everyone that has supported us through Patreon. It means a lot and helps us give back to you all as well. We're going to be doing an, either a book or from one of our guests or maybe even a bottle of bourbon next month, so stay tuned. We'll be having a giveaway every single month, so make sure you go to patreon.com P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash bourbon pursuit and support the show. Welcome back to another episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Kenny and Ryan here, and we are on site today. Uh, we're going to cross another DSP off the list today. Ryan, you want to talk and tell people where we're at today? Yeah, we're back in, if you may or may not know, I grew up in Bardstown. And uh, <laughs> we're back in Bardstown, and... I uh, actually went to school right across the street from here. Uh, we'd always, you know, smell the mash. We're at Barton's today. Uh, super excited about it. And I know Kenny's, like, thrilled. On the way down here, I told him that Barton's made Kentucky Tavern. He's like, no way. Are you serious? And I was like, yes, Kenny, talk about your yeah, affliction. With, I've, got uh, a, I've, got a, I've got a long history of love affair with Kentucky Tavern because when I went to college, it was that was the bourbon staple. That was the bourbon of choice that our fraternity had. It was Handles of Kentucky Tavern every single weekend. And I, I don't know why, but we always loved the label because it said the aristocrat of bourbons. I mean, we, we were dumb frat kids. Like, we didn't even right. know what aristocrat really meant, right? But we loved it. And I remember it was probably a good three years ago. It was when they started put. maybe it was two years ago. Hell, it might have been a year ago. I've, I've lost track of time now. But they rebranded the label, and now it no longer says the aristocrat of bourbon on the label now and a little piece of me was taken away your heart was pulled out of your chest yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but again we are here at barton's today and uh, we have to give a shout out to adam johnson of the kentucky bourbon affair uh, in the in the kda uh, just because we wouldn't have met josh we wouldn't have met a lot of great people without getting some of the media passes that were going on to the bourbon affair that's we had a chance to actually meet josh at whiskey live this year he was handing out samples of 1792 foolproof so i had my first sample of that there but uh so again and thank you very much, Adam, for, for handing those out. But this is a good time to introduce our guest today. So today we have Josh Hollifield. Josh is the Visitor Center Manager for Barton 1792 Distillery. So, Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Did I get your title right? You did. <laughs> okay. You did. So kind of give us a, some idea of, of what else you do here at the distillery. Mainly I, I manage the hospitality operations here, so tours and gift shop. Um, but above that, also deal with the, any of the type of brand promotion stuff. So any of the events that we participate in, the Kentucky Bourbon Festival or anywhere else that I can help out with the brand. I, I've been to several whiskey fests as well. So just and as you saw me at the at the uh, Whiskey Live. So, so talk talk about a little bit your your coming of age tale to bourbon. Like how how did you get into it? We we were talking a little bit before we started recording that you grew up in Louisville. You know we're both Louisville guys as well. Well, actually, everybody Ryan's from Bardstown. If you didn't know that, <laughs> but it's so we we've, we've kind of grown up in Kentucky and been a little surrounded by bourbon. But what sort of influenced you to get into the industry? Um, really, it started in college. I think as as most of us go, um, you know, at, at it was being Kentucky a, Tavern. It was Kentucky unfortunately, Tavern. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, it was not Tavern, um, but. Uh, being a Kentucky boy, as I, I started experimenting with alcohol, I wanted to go to our home spirit of bourbon. So I worked my way, actually started with Jim Beam. I worked my way through every affordable label of Jim Beam that I could find. Um, then finally, one weekend, I found myself with nothing to do. So I left Lexington at UK and drove over to Versailles to the Woodford Reserve Distillery. I took in that tour, and at that point, I was hooked. Uh, so then I just kind of Went on from there, experimenting with more and more bourbon and getting more in-depth uh, with what I like. And then uh, had really fell in love with 1792 beforehand, um, but then had the opportunity to come down here out of the restaurant industry uh, where I was at and get into a little bit more normal schedule. And then also getting into an industry that I love with, uh, with bourbon. That's awesome. 
So also give us some idea of, you know, how long you've been at the distillery and is this the only job you've held or, you know, uh, what, what else is, have you been doing here? I was hired in three and a half years ago. So November of 2012 um, to run the visitor center and, and operations. And, and the job has, has expanded from there, uh, strictly hired in for tours and, and gift shop. But, you know, loving the industry and then loving the brand itself, anything that we can do to get out there, you know, that the way our visitor operations uh, run for Sazerac, both Buffalo Trace here and Ace Meth Bowman, is we see that as uh, visitors as a marketing opportunity. So we don't charge for any of our tours or our tastings. We want you to come in, have a good time, learn the story behind the brand, how it's made, and then hopefully we create a, a fan out of that. So, you know, the end goal uh, for the visitor operation is to push the brands and to get brand awareness out there. Some of our listeners may not know that uh, Sazerac, who also owns Buffalo Trace, did acquire you. So kind of give a little bit of background into there as well so people kind of understand the uh, the hierarchy of, of bourbon, if oh, you will. Oh, sure. Um, so Sazerac is a uh, American company. It's a family-based company out of uh, New Orleans. So we are still family-owned. We're not publicly traded. Um Prior to that, we were owned by Constellation Spirits, um, which is another large liquor company. As they were reducing their footprint into distilled spirits, they had sold off Barton Brands um, to Sazerac in 2009. When Sazerac picked up Barton, they uh, more than doubled the size of their company in one purchase. Uh, with that, they got all of the brands that came with Barton, uh, which were hundreds of brands, um, not just bourbon, but uh, other vodkas, gins, other spirits as well. Um, and they also picked up all of our facilities, which included the Barton Distillery, which is where we're at today, the Glenmore Distillery out of Owensboro, as well as a uh, shipping and processing plant in Carson, California, as well as uh, Maryland. Cool. So I kind of want to ask, ask a little bit about the grounds. Give us a little bit of history of, of what this distillery is here in Bardstown. Sure. We, uh, we sit in a small valley um, right on the outside of Bardstown, Kentucky. We're less than a mile from the city center, so you can actually walk here from the courthouse um, if you wanted to. Uh, we sit on 196 acres, uh, which includes 28 traditional rick houses and, and the distillery, as well as a mega warehouse that will hold another 80,000 barrels. So we have a full barrel capacity here of over 600,000 barrels. Um, so it is a, a good piece of space. Um, I like to tell people we're on the small side of big. So with over half a million barrels in stock, uh, we're not a craft distiller by any means as far as produ barrel production. But uh, when you look at us next to you know some of our neighbors here in town, like Heaven Hill, that has over a million barrels or over Jim Beam that has over two, not quite to that size. Um, but we've been here since 1879, um, basically continuously distilling except minus the years of prohibition. So what happened during Prohibition? Kind of give us a little bit of background during sure. there. During Prohibition, um, if you look at uh, history uh, of distilleries, how many distilleries were lost during Prohibition, it really kind of uh, threw a wrench into the screws um, for, um, for bourbon distillation. Different distilleries that did not get a medicinal license um, maintained the properties in different ways. Um, many, like us, were able to contract through distillers that had a medicinal license. So whatever barrels that we did not lose due to either confiscation or, or theft, uh, we were able to sell out. Um, so if you look at Dusty Bottles uh, collections, you'll see Tom Moore medicinal whiskey, um, which was one of the one of the bourbons that we were making at the time. So I guess that also kind of talks about, we didn't get a chance to go see it when we, we did our little quick uh, run through of the distillery, but you also have like a historic spring here on the grounds that sort of uh, has fed all the limestone water and it's called the Thomas Moore Spring. Talk a little bit about yeah, that was and, Thomas Moore and, and, and what all that is. Tom Moore was a, a distiller. Um, he was married into the original distillery here on this property was the Willett and Frankie distillery that operated off of the Morton Spring, which is still on the property. We don't use that spring, but it still uh, has a pretty good flow to it. Um, he married into the Willett family um, or was re related in along with his business partner, um, Ben Mattingly, and formed a, took over the Willett and Frankie distillery and became the Mattingly and Moore distillery. Um, then somewhere during, uh, just due to title changes and, and whatnot, Tom Moore left that distillery to form his own distillery in the same valley, operating off another natural spring, which is now called the Tom Moore Spring. So it's a, a limestone rich water, and that's why 95% of the world's bourbon is created here in the state of Kentucky. Um, one of the reasons, because of our limestone rich water. 
Um, and we still use that spring today, but of course our production uh, levels up quite a bit higher. So we still have a uh, 28 acre lake off property that we supplement our water source from. It is Springfield as well. Right. Well, yeah. I saw some pictures of the spring itself. Like, yeah, you're not you're not filling 800 800 barrels a day. Right. Exactly Hundred thousand barrels with that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So I, I guess the so we know what happened to the Willett family. That was kind of the other side of it of, of the what, kind of what happened, right? Because we know mm-hmm. Willett is uh, if you could throw a football, like you could probably almost hit it from here, right? Maybe maybe a few. Uh, how about a, how to punt kick pass? Yeah, Something like maybe. That. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so it's a it's a good rich history that's actually happened here at Bardstown. What talk about some of like the recent history, right? Because we've seen a, a huge resurgence with some of the brands that are coming out of Barton. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, um, go back to 2000, prior to 2009, um, when Sazerac bought us, uh, our parent company at the time was, um, kind of, like I said, reducing their footprint in distilled spirits. So of course they weren't putting any weight behind the brands. Um, but then in conjunction with this, this really bourbon push that we've seen over the last, you know, five to 10 years, um, things have really stepped up. Um, so it's a good time to be in bourbon, but you look at our all of our brands are doing well, uh, particularly 1792. Sazerac has really put some effort behind that, as you've seen some of our expressions come out. But even beyond that, you look at Very Old Barton is on allocation. Kentucky Tavern's on allocation. Kentucky Gentleman is ty- hard to find sometimes. So we make eight different brands here, and they're, for the most part, all doing pretty well. well let's talk about those different brands, sure. right? Yeah, so kind of kind of give our listeners, like, everything that they could expect when they come to visit Barton, like what, what they understand is coming out of here and, and leaving your loading docks. Okay. Okay. Um, out of this property, we, we promote eight brands that we produce here. Um, starting kind of towards the bottom, you have Ten High and Kentucky Gentleman, which are both blends. Um, you also have Tom Moore and Colonel Lee, uh, which are more marketed to the Deep South states. I was about to say, I was like, you don't really see Colonel Lee yeah. around here because I've, I've seen it, let me think, in Florida or Atlanta or something like right, that. Right, so that brand actually died at one point. We totally got rid of it and then brought it back. Um, but it's on the mar- But it's only available in some of the deep south states uh, two or three states some of the brands are not widely promoted um but then stepping on uh, going up a little bit further up you've got uh zachariah harris uh kentucky tavern very old barton in 1792 so talk about some of the ages that are in each one of these two because i know it varies um throughout all of them sure um age statements we we've dropped the age statements on most of our bourbons as a lot of brands have because it you know with bourbon being in a shortage um you don't want to cancel a barrel out that's seven years old that still tastes this some of them taste yeah. some of them taste better than the eight years old so you yeah. hate to push those barrels out of the way just based on on the extra age so we have lost the age statement um, on most of our brands however 1792 is still around an eight-year-old bourbon uh Varel barton comes in around a six and then the the others are a little bit lesser okay because i think when i still go to the liquor store and i see Varel barton most of the time it's i can still find an age statement so is that is that kind of going away where the age dated six right is? and we we don't claim it's at six years old um anymore but uh, i'm not aware that that it's less than six but Right. Yeah, and VOB kind of has like a cult following. <laughs> what, it does. Why is that? I mean, I know it's a good product, but it's just it's crazy that the cult following it has. Yeah, it, well, it's a great bourbon. It comes in four different and proof. great value. Yeah, great value. I, I've seen the, the 86 proof, which is the number one seller out of the four proofs, um, go anywhere from $10 to $15 for a fifth. Um, it's a regional bourbon, so a lot of people outside the area don't know about it. Um, it's not marketed in all 50 states. Um, it is a bourbon drinker's bourbon. It's very straightforward, very traditional in flavor. So if you think about bourbon, that's what you're going to get out of Very Old Barton. So we hear people, you know, that talk about Very Old Barton, everything. That's what my grandfather always drank, or that's what I cut my teeth on, or, you know, <laughs> right. that's what I... Hot that, toddies. That's where I started out in college. Um, comes in four different proofs, so it, it kind of goes the whole range from an 80 proof um, all the way up to 100 proof. So 80, 86, 90, and 100 proof. You know, most of your bartenders and a lot of bourbon purists like the 100 proof. It's still bottled in bond. Um, it's the only product that we make out of here bottled in bond. Um, you know, the 86 proof is a nice mellow bourbon, um, but still full flavored. So a lot of that, like I said, number one seller um, out of the four. So I'm going to question uh, some of the, well, I'm not going to question, but I'm going to kind of uh, try to gauge your, your level of knowledge here on the individual brands themselves. So do you have any kind of like... Uh, idea of like the history of the labels themselves like where very old barton just the name came from or was it just the barton distillery in there like we're just gonna slap very old on it yeah <laughs> well barton um was brought in by oscar Getz. um oscar Getz and lester abelson bought up the distillery in the 1940s um they owned a liquor distributor in uh, chicago 
Barton Brands. And then they wanted to get into production. Uh, when we've asked, we've asked uh, Oscar Getz family, uh, people have asked Oscar Getz before, prior to his passing in the 1980s, he always said he just picked the name out of a hat. So, <laughs> nice. How about it? And so, then Real then, strategic. Yeah, yeah, so and then 1792, for anybody that doesn't know, Ryan, I'll question you. Do you know why it was called 1792? Uh... Independence Day or something. <laughs> so, in, in a matter of ways, yes. Yeah, it's, so it's it's when Kentucky finally became a state. Yeah, right? Kentucky. Correct. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We were originally the largest county in Virginia. Um, so we finally got our, our walking paper, so to speak, um, on June 1st of 1792 to become the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Yeah. And so this was also something else that, that we talked about this before we started recording. We were kind of going through is that if anybody's out there and they might find some old bottles on the shelf, you'll see 1792 and it says Ridgemont Reserve. So kind of talk about what Ridgemont is in regards to the, the, the whole thing here that's going on at Barton. Yes. Yeah, so our, our previous bottle, um, it was January of last year when we did a little bit, I say a little bit, but it was a, a pretty big bottle decoration change. Uh, the bourbon in the so- inside the bottle stayed the same, but um, the previous bottle had white lettering that said 1792, and then below that in gold said Ridgemont Reserve. Uh, Ridgemont Reserve referred to our still, which was called the Ridgemont Still. Reserve meaning the best that came off the Ridgemont Still. Um, the reason we dropped that is just to clean up the bottle a little bit, and then also to um, basically outside the distillery, uh, Ridgemont didn't hold any weight. So, um, so the the general public, there's no, there's no Ridge. We're not in Ridgemont, Kentucky. There's no Mister Ridgemont. So, <laughs> right. Like outside the property, it didn't hold any weight. And then also, we knew that we were going to come out with the expressions, um, and in order not to clutter up the bottle uh, with those different labels, we dropped the Ridgemont so that we could put the other other taglines in there. So talk about the still itself, right? Because you're giving us a little bit of factoids about how it's, I don't know, the biggest one in the world or whatever it is, right? So kind of kind of talk and give our listeners, um, you know, some more selling points of why they should come visit Barton. Sure. It's not quite the biggest, but it is one of the biggest in bourbon operation. Um, it's six feet wide and five stories tall. Um, it is column still, so it's continuous distillation, theoretically. We still run in batches. Um, <clears throat> we're running that still pretty much seven days a week. We also have a doubler, which is a second still on top of the roof. Um, so out of that still, uh, our first distillation, our low wines coming out about 125 proof. Once we run it through the doubler, our finished distillate, or white dog, like we saw at the top of the still, is coming out around 140 proof. So we just tasted it. It was pretty tasty. Yeah, I know. It's, it smelled like fire, but it tasted good going Yeah, down. I know. Exactly. Right, and that's another interesting thing about bourbon that I find that even outside of the finished product, as you go from distillery to distillery, if you get an opportunity to taste their white dog or their distillate, everybody's distillate is going to taste a little bit different. Right. And I honestly, once you taste it out of the still or out of uh, the box right there, when it's a little warm, it almost tastes better than like having to like have it set aside and have right, it be cold. Chill it. Yeah, it, yeah, it almost tastes better that way. Um, so we talked, you kind of hinted at the 1792 expressions. Let's, let's talk about those a little bit because, um, as we said, there's seen, we've seen a resurgence in the past year and we've seen a lot of people and um, a lot of rave reviews on, yeah, on some of them. People go ape shit over it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. we, we, we can, yeah. we can be real about it. Right. So, I mean, you've got your, your 1792, then you got, uh, sweet wheat, then you had the port finish and then, you know, you just recently came out with a brand new one too, but I'm not going to ruin it. So you kind of, kind of talk about, uh, the lines and, and, you know, whether some are going to make a reappearance or the history of them why they're even there to begin with sure um so in conjunction with the bottle decoration change that we just talked about um we knew that we wanted to come out with a kind of things to spice things up a little bit and uh, show a little bit more depth to this distillery that people weren't accustomed to uh people know this distillery as a workhorse but have not really known us for for what we can do um so and getting a little bit deeper in the brand uh, prior to the Sazerac purchase, we had started putting away a wheat bourbon. Um, as I'm sure most of your listeners are aware, the two main recipes are bourbon. Of uh, bourbon are uh, corn, barley, and rye, um, or corn, barley, and wheat. This distillery is known for our, our rye recipes. 1792 is a high rye brand, so it's got a lot of spice to it. So we put away this wheat recipe, so replacing that rye with wheat, came out with a full flavored uh, wheat bourbon. Uh, aged it seven years in the top floor of our warehouse, so it picked up a lot of body. Came in at 91.2 proof, um, so it's a, a great wheat bourbon. Um, as soon as you nose it, uh, you're going to know it's a wheat right off the batch, or, or right off, sorry, right off the start uh, from the nose. 
Um, but then also it carries a lot of body because it aged in the, in the top of the warehouse. So it picked a lot of flavor up from that Oak. So it's one of my favorite wheat bourbons on the market, not just because it pays my paycheck, but also <laughs> because, because it holds a body that a lot of wheat, uh, bourbons don't hold. Um, now our second expression to come out later, uh, that year was our port finish. A funny story about our port finishes a couple of years ago, we were doing tours and, uh, there were a line of port barrels that rolled out onto the tour floor and uh, not rolled out. They were just there one day when we came in. So I asked our master distiller at the time, you know, what's up with the port barrels over in the the side of the warehouse? And, you know, he would never lie to me, but he just wouldn't answer my question. (laughs) (laughs) He said, what port barrels? And about a week later, they were gone. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, Yeah. they they were gone. And then finally, two years later, we found out what it was. So what happened uh, with the port finish, that was our second expression. We took our 1792 rye mash bill put it away for six years in the oak casks. Um, after it was finished in the oak in six years, uh, we put it into port wine casks for another two years. So it was a two-year port finish. Most port finishes on the market are about six months old. Um, ours was two years. So the, with that one, a little bit different in that um, really kind of uh, sweetened it up a little bit so you get dried fruit and oats out of it, um, really develop those middle fruity flavors of the bourbon. The nice thing, too, is it took a little bit, a little bit of the bite um, that sometimes you get out of the rye uh, because we are a high rye mash bill. Um, but then uh, it came in at 88.9 proof. Is it it's like a type of or the brand of port that you used? Or, I or is it... investigated those barrels. I couldn't find the brand. <laughs> gotcha. <anywhere>. So <laughs> I don't think it was particularly one brand that we, we've really kind of talked about. I just know that it, in big, bold letters on the side of the barrel, it said port. So there was no joke what, about what it. A lot of companies have done a port. What is it about port that, you know, it makes it a good I guess cast to finish it in but it's just a nice addition kind of the it brings a a deep fruity note to the bourbon uh, which complements to the bourbon recipe uh, without conflicting against that so gotcha so uh, talk about uh, are you going to see any more of these because I mean like you just said that you know Barton and 1792 hadn't been known for that right you wanted to show a little bit more depth now were these just like one-time experiments and you're like well we'll see what happens you're like oh shit like we did something really well here like we Mm -hmm. should we should continue this well I know that they started putting weed away for for a while so we've got uh, I hope we have more in stock that we will eventually see the wheat you know for a couple more times it's been released twice uh, so once over the the past couple years um Port finish, we didn't have any plans to redo, so that was a one and done. Uh, so if you can find a bottle out there, definitely pick it up because um, that we don't have any direct plans. To re- you haven't re- seen any port barrels rolling around again? <laughs> <laughs> Not seen any, other than the empty ones sitting up at the barrel shed. Uh, so we haven't seen any more port barrels. Um, we did release a couple more expressions, the single barrel expression, which was a little bit higher proof, eighty-eight or um, 98.6. Uh, proof versus the 93.7 proof of course every single barrel is going to taste a little bit different so allows you to kind of play around uh, so as you look at your your local retailers they're going to have the opportunity to do their own private picks as well so you'll see those hit hit the market as well um, and then our full proof w- which we just came out with uh, earlier this summer full proof is 125 proof version so rather than doing a barrel strength we took it back to what our entry proof is so we distill up to about 140 proof, goes into the barrel no higher than 125 proof by law. So that's what we fill our barrels at. We age our barrels high, so our proof goes up. So our finished barrels are about 130 to 140 proof. We brought it just down to 125 proof. And the nice thing about that for, I'm sure that your listeners will like this, is that that is our only product that is non-chill filtered. Oh, there you go. That's awesome. awesome. So I guess talk a little bit more about that. What was the idea of, of bringing a barrel proof, well, I guess not technically barrel proof, maybe it's, uh, what would you call it, entry proof mm-hmm. offering to market, right? Like what was, the, what was the motivation factor behind that? We wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, you know, barrel proof is great. If you ever get a chance to try barrel proof bourbon, by all means, and do so. It's like heaven in a bottle. Yeah, it's like HD for, you know, for <laughs> <Yeah>. HD. <laughs> so um, basically we wanted to put a product out that was higher proof. Um, we wanted to do something a little bit different, but also anytime that you do a, a, a new product on the market, you have to get TTP label approval, um, which includes proof changes. So if you do a barrel proof one year and then a barrel proof the next year, your proofs might not be the same proof. So you're going to have to get new label approval. So we wanted a product that we could continuously come out with and not have to, to chase that label approval time over time. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, it's still a steady proof. It's high proof. Um, and it's unique that it came in at, at barrel entry proof. 
talk a little bit more about that in regards to barrel picks because we've seen a lot of people i mean you can go across the nation and you can go to a lot of liquor stores and they've got you know 1792 single barrels um but then we just learned this past week so owen powell who's another friend of the show um he works at beverage warehouse uh, that's actually in louisville and he came and was picking out a, a bottle or a barrel of 1792 and he asked he says can we make this a foolproof and apparently, like, it's going to go green light, got the rubber stamp. And so is that something that um, for some of our special listeners out there that have those relationships with liquor stores and have the opportunity to go and do those barrel picks, like, could they for, uh, possibly see in their future having a 1792 foolproof uh, single barrel pick? Yes. Um, so prior to uh, the release of the single barrel, um, all of the private picks that came out of here were still in the small batch bottle. It still said small batch, but it would have their own private single barrel select medallion. This year when we released the single barrel, first step was to allow that um, that single barrel pick to actually go into a single barrel bottle, which was nice because that consistent on the label. Um, price point's a little bit higher, but not out of reach. And then just recently with the foolproof, we've just started to release uh, the option of a foolproof single barrel uh, picks. Uh, so Owen's uh, account, Beverage Warehouse, is going to be one of the first uh, that we're able to do so on that. Um, I just picked out my first barrel uh, foolproof uh, yesterday with the Harrison Smith House uh, restaurant here in town. Uh, so we'll, we'll hope to see that. And there's one being bottled right now for, I think, the, the Georgia Bourbon Society. Awesome. So if you couldn't get a bottle of the 1792 uh, port finish, you don't have to like go crazy trying to get the foolproof because it sounds like it's going to be a little bit easier and these will maybe be a, a as usual. these private picks come out they, there should be a little bit more on the market because we're gonna, the, with the foolproof um it might come out from time to time but it's going to be a very limited release and the same thing with the single barrel um as you see the general release it'll be a, very limited so you'll see people chasing it um but then you know the the glory behind doing a single barrel in addition to you know, the foolproof, as, as good as it is, with the single barrel, then you'll get to get a, a fuller uh, strength bourbon that somebody hand-selected out of a selection of anywhere from five to ten barrels. So Awesome. That's so cool. I think we uh, we might have beaten the 1792 horse at death here. <laughs> so let's, let's kind of talk a little bit more um, about Barton and the brands in general. So we talked before the show that you have four different mash bills that are, that are here, right? Can Correct. You, can you talk a little bit about those, like what makes one different than the other, anything well, like that? Mash bills, as, as everybody knows, are recipes. So they're going to vary in, in how how much grain goes into it, whether it's corn, rye, or barley. Um, you know, Sazerac's very protective about those mash bills. I always tell the story. I went to Ken Pierce, our master's still, our previous master's stiller at the time, and asked him about mash bills my first uh, week here, and he told me to mind my own business and go back to the beer shop. <laughs> no, he, he was actually very nice about it, but he let me know that Sazerac is very protective of our mash bills. So um, it's not information. Rightfully so. Yeah. Uh, it's not information we typically release as far as what percentages actually go into those mash bills. The, the one bit of information that we do tell is here at Barton, we have four mash bills. Three of them are rye focused and one is wheat. So, But we hardly ever use the wheat. We only have the capacity to hold three grains at a time. So we have to put our wheat into our rye bin, burn through the wheat, and then turn over to rye. And usually once we start up with our rye mash bills, we'll push on through. You're going to do that for a little uh, bit. Th- is there, do you all have any rye, or I guess rye whiskey um, mash bills that are not bourbon, I guess? But we do know. have a straight rye mash bill um, that we do some uh, either brands that we don't really promote that come out of here um, or uh, NDPs. Gotcha. That we do, but um, any plans for a rye label out here? Oh, or? I'd love to see one. I would too. I'm starting to get into the rye more. Yeah, it, it, rye's coming along. At you know, I've heard uh, Jimmy Russell over at Wild Turkey uh, a lot of times say, you know, it, you think bourbon's hot, and you know, look at how rye's coming along. Yeah, exactly. So. So talk about some of the other, at least I was doing a little research when I came here. You guys age other spirits here as well, we right? Do. So yes. kind of kind of talk about that. Um, our previous owners, Constellation Spirits, own Palmasan Brandy. Um, they already had this process in place, so we kept it as a contract. Um, when we dump our bourbon barrels out, of course, by law, you cannot use a used barrel in bourbon production. So we will um, put California Grape Brandy into the barrels and put them back in the warehouse from two to four years. So we have uh, we age brandy on the first three floors of our warehouse and then bourbon fourth floor and above. So how's that work? Are you guys like shipping the barrels somewhere and then the barrels are making their way back here to be aged? Or are you guys making it here? Or how, how's that uh, work? No, we don't make it here. Uh, so it comes into us raw spirit. So just raw distilled brandy comes in by tanker. Um, then we basically we dump the barrels here on property 
um, and then we'll put the brandy in, age it, and then we dump the brandy, and then we bottle the brandy and ship it back out as full cases. So I guess you you, named, you talked about Ken Pierce already. So if anybody doesn't know, Ken Pierce was the master distiller here uh, at Barton. Uh, he retired back in May of this past year. Um, so you said you had some some run-ins with him. I mean, other than him saying to go mind your own business, right? Uh, <laughs> what other kind of like uh, life lessons or any kind of like good lessons about the industry or the trade that you learned directly from him? Oh, uh, lots of lots of great things. I mean, uh, you know. It, I'm not a, a chemistry guy. I'm not a production guy. I come from a marketing background uh, with a marketing degree from the University of Kentucky. So there's lots of times I would just come in and ask him questions about how stuff's made and how stuff works. And, you know, he would... You're like my daughter, right? Why? Yeah, why? Why? <laughs> why? <laughs> but he, he was very gracious about letting me know. Um, but then he was also good about no, seeing my eyes glass over when we start talking about pH or <laughs> protein. Over your head, yeah. I'm just like, I'm done. Yeah. Um, you know, w- for example, I, I was talking to him um, about proof, barrel proof. Um, you know, uh, seeing our barrels, I had proofed some of our barrels out. You know, coming out anywhere from 130 to 140 proof finished. Um, but then I, I ran across another barrel strength on the market from a, a competing brand that was like 114 proof. And I said, I asked him about how does that work? I mean, I, I understand, you know, the evaporation out of the barrel, we get water loss. So, of course, our, our concentration of alcohol is going to be higher. And he's talking about the brand that aged their bourbon low. Um, so that's one thing he explained to me because they age low, just like scotches, you don't get the temperature fluctuation because the, the climate in Scotland is different from ours. Their proof goes down as well. So if you age your bourbon low, your proof is going to go down. Whereas if you age your bur- bourbon high, your proof is going to go up. So that's just an example of, of one of the lessons he taught me. So, and, and then just hearing his stories. Mm-hmm. <laughs> No, so I've also read there. There, this time they haven't named a successor yet. So you're going to start gunning for his Get job, or you're going to? No, no. <laughs> yeah, one of my friends on the on the bourbon boards uh, asked me about that. So now that he's gone, it might have takes place. And I said no. I, you know, I was lucky to pass Kim too in college. So. Right, yeah. <laughs> So I, I guess a, a good question to ask about you, because there's uh, first, how many people come through the visitor center here at Barton? Because it's it's not uh, maybe well known by a lot of people, right? Yeah, and it's fairly new, too. Relatively new. We started doing public tours. Our visitor center opened in 2011. Um, so you look at us, look at us next to our sister company, um, Buffalo Trace. Um, that brand came out in 99, I believe. Um, they're doing over 100,000 people a year. Um, we this we just finished out our fiscal year uh, last week and uh, finished out with over 26,000 visitors here. So um, probably not a, as big as a lot, but we've got great growth. Um, the thing about it is uh, our main goal here is to push the brand. So if we can get people in that may not know what's made here, um, we'll, we can turn them on to Varial Barton or 17i2. Um, but vice versa, strengthening the relationships we have with our regular fans. You know, a lot of people that, that are fans of 17i2 don't know that it's made at Barton. So getting them in here and kind of showing them how it's made. Um, so it's kind of a, a circular thing. We want the visitors um, to push the brand, and then the brand also pushes the visitors too. So 26,000 people rolled through here. There has to be at least something that's common that uh, is among a few different people that maybe they're always surprised about after taking the tour. Do you, do you kind of have any idea of, of what people might come away with that they didn't know about before because they, they made it to Barton? Sure. Uh, one thing is they don't know how big this property is. Um, you know, From the street, it looks like we have five warehouses because you drive down into the valley. Um, when you get down here, you learn that we are on 196 acres, and we have 28 or 29 warehouses, actually. So. Yeah, and if you keep going down, I guess, Boston Road, you can see all those and how, how big the property actually is Right. when you're going like past Simpson Lake and all that. Yeah. So it's it's a huge property. What else makes the, the distillery and the tour unique compared to maybe some other ones that are that you, you have opportunities to go? Sure. We, we like to pride ourselves in that we provide a authentic experience. So as we saw, we walked through the distillery. It's not made up. Um, you're not behind glass. You're right there next to the still. You could reach out and touch it, although we don't encourage you to. <laughs> it's Particularly, hot. Yeah, it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, we go into an authentic warehouse. You'll see the barrels that are there aging. Um, so you get the real experience. We, we haven't dressed any of the operations up for tours. It's And then we have uh, several tours a day that go through the bottling halls. So you'll see... Bottles being filled, a lot of times it's not bourbon. Uh, we do bottle a lot of other products. Um, 
then we have a, an estate tour that goes out uh, once a day, Monday through Friday, and that's a two-hour experience. It's a motorized tour, so you'll see the distillery, a traditional warehouse bottling, but you also go up to our palletized warehouse, uh, which holds 80,000 barrels, as well as barrel fill and barrel dump, so you'll see pretty much everything here. Um, also, nice photo op as we are home to the world's largest bourbon barrel. Um, so I saw that mm-hmm. I was it was going by. I was like, oh, it's like going around the street and be like, oh, there's the biggest ball of yarn, right? We got to get <laughs> yeah. a picture, right? Yeah. Guinness Book <laughs> World Record. Yeah. So uh, one last question I have for you. Um, so we were in the gift shop before we came here and we saw you, and I saw this. You have like half gallon bags full of like barrel char. Mm-hmm. So kind of talk about like a, a the idea behind it and b like some of the uses for it. Sure. The one of the byproducts of dumping the barrel out, uh, derp- you got to think the insides of those barrels are charred or burnt. Um, so naturally, with a higher char, some of that's going to flake off. Mm-hmm. So as we dump the, the bourbon out, the first thing we do is screen filter it, pulling any of that char out. And there's a lot of char that comes out of there. Uh, when we started doing uh, public visitors here, we started bagging that up and selling it in one-gallon bags. And you can use that. What we encourage people to use it for is... Uh, as wood chips for smoking so you can put them in aluminum pie tin right on top of your gas grill or on top of the coals of your your smoker and it will help um not impede a nice bourbon yeah. flavor to it um I've, we've actually had people come in and they buy it for potpourri <laughs> oh interesting and the nice thing about it if it loses its scent you just dump some more bourbon over top of it That's perfect. <laughs> so what's what's next for barton next for barton um we're hoping to i know that we are planning to um expand our dryer house and get a new dryer house our dryer house now is from 1946 um, so it definitely needs to be replaced um, i'm hoping that eventually once they move that dryer house out that we'll have an event space here um, and then we're also looking at visitor center expansion but as we continue to, to increase production as well you'll be seeing us adding more tanks um, you'll definitely see brand wise you'll see more and more expressions of the 1792 coming down the line as well Good. I think that's what everybody wants to hear yeah, is more expressions, hear, right? For yeah. sure. <laughs> well, Josh, I want to say thank you again for coming on the show today. This was uh, fantastic to get insights into 1792. As I was saying before we started, we can check another DSP another off the list, still, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I, I, I was glad we got to come. Not a lot of people know you know, the Barton name. They know they might recognize 1792, but they might not know the Barton name, and I'm glad we can give our Or list. Kentucky Tavern, right? Or Kentucky Tavern, <laughs> which we know quite too well. But uh, I'm glad we give some of those listeners that may not know the story behind it and stuff because it is interesting and it's cool, you know, being from Bardstown. To, right, uh, and and not only that, I mean, there's, I mean, you're in Bardstown, right? So there's plenty of distilleries around. So make sure you come to Bardstown, uh, ask to see Josh. He'll give you a private tour, right? <laughs> <laughs> He'll take you right up to the still, right up to touch the, it, yeah, and get some white dog. <laughs> but uh, honestly, Josh, thank you again for being on the show today. This was a, it was a pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you all for inviting me. Sure. Glad to have you all down. So if you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes. Also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, all those other great social media channels. If you like the show, also support us on Patreon. Uh, We've got a lot of great gifts that we're sending out for all of our listeners. We gave just Josh one of the limited edition koozies as well. So uh, yeah, and and we saw a cool gift. I think we're going to be giving out for next. Oh yeah, we're we're in the we're in the gift shop, so we're going to go shopping here a minute for for some of our listeners. Some goodies for you guys. But make sure you go to Patreon. That's p a t r e o n dot com slash bourbon pursuit. Yeah, and all as always, we love uh, suggestions, feedback, any comments that you guys can give us. We just want to keep this thing going and making it better each time. So uh, we'll see you next time. This podcast of Bourbon Pursuit is in partnership with thewhiskeywash.com, a lifestyle website for news and reviews for people who like whiskey. And for those who think a life without whiskey has no style, thewhiskeywash.com. Thank you.